Welcome back to this Delay, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News Channel. Still with me in the studio, I have Professor Bola Kentano, our Director General, Bulitak Center for International Diplomacy and Strategic Studies. Professor Anthony Killer, International Director of Studies at the European Center of Advanced and Professional Studies. Yemi Adamoleku, Executive Director in Office of, and Dr. Ndidi Nwaneri, Public Policy Consultant and Visiting Scholar at the Loyola University, Chicago, uh, United States. Well, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen, before we move on very quickly, uh, I would like to have your take on the two subjects we've already taken, beginning with uh, the indictment of Deputy Commissioner of Police, um, Abba Kiari, and the reaction of the uh, Nigeria Police, the Inspector General of Police, and the uh, Police uh, Service uh, Commission, and the implications for the integrity and reputation of the Nigeria Police and also the international relations implications as already uh, discussed by our first guest, uh, AIG uh, Alakmane retired. And then the second issue, of course, about the Global Education Summit hosted by uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson of the United Kingdom and the President of uh, Kenya, uh, President uh, Kenyatta, attended uh, by President uh, Muhammadu Buhari of Nigeria, where President uh, Muhammadu Buhari made certain uh, commitments. Uh, Professor Kila, let me start with you. Good, good evening, everybody. I, I think the, the two issues. Um, on the issue of the um, suspension and the allegation against the um, police officer, I think the AIG that spoke demonstrated um, an interesting candor, albeit with a lot of um, understatement on the issue. It is my view that Nigeria needs to go beyond candor and get passion, if not favor, in the case of the Nigerian police force. The Nigerian country or Nigerian people's image is not at stake with this issue. What is at stake is you know, the freedom of the police officer because if he's indicted and arrested, he's gonna to go to jail. The FBI does not joke. There's very little that can stop that if they find him guilty and they can prove it. The, the image of the Nigerian police force is really at stake. It, it seems to me that the single police officer and, but above all, the system is really on the trial here because um, we're gonna see how things are dealt with in one country and how it is dealt with in Nigeria. And we're soon going to be seeing how low cases of impunity and um, unabashed discretions are different in, in two places. There, there is something, when we talk about senior officers or senior officials in Nigeria, especially the police, but like a lot of other organs of the system, they, they tend to strike me as children who are not trained at home and then they are chastised outside their families, because nobody has kept them in check um, very well. It is interesting to know that the Nigerian police force has not um, by itself indicted its own people this way. It is interesting to know that whilst the people of Nigeria, when they drive on the roads and walk in the street and trade in their market, they complain about the police generally, accusing them of either begging, extorting, or outrightly colluding with the criminals they're supposed to be guarding, there is no open and clear channel for Nigerians to denounce the police. And there are no known trial of indicted police officers. That says a lot about the, the system. So that system is really on trial. And the reaction of the system to deal with this thing would say a lot about the whole, um, the whole Nigerian police force itself. It is my view that the Nigerian police force needs a radical review, to proper overhauling. Given the chance, I would almost take down everything we have now and rebuild it again. And the police of the future 
will be a police built on the fact that we know people in uniform are prone to corruptions. So let us build an institution that does not allow them to abuse the power they have. The, the police of the future will be a police force that is calculated and built to make sure police are not, or the police force is not understaffed, ill-equipped, ill-trained, and overused. And, and we have to think that way to make it happen. The police of the future should not be a friend of the public. It should be servants of the public. They are wardens of our streets and our markets. And they should be trained that way. And they should know that they are accountable from the most junior one to the most senior one. And I also think that in appointing the head of police force, especially the I, um, IG, Inspector General of Police, Perhaps this time we make them make an application where they explain exactly what they intend to do in their tenure. And whether they're elected or selected or nominated, let whoever is doing that justify why he's choosing this candidate over the other. And I think the issue of corruption is a major issue, but also that of welfare that they need to train. Um, it's a matter of ethics, really. On the matter of education, if we're putting the whole thing, the two things together. I think, you know, it's overall, it's a good thing that the Nigerian president goes to a global summit on education, especially because there is possibility of getting money there. And also overall, it appears the thing appears to be a thing of um, head of state. But unlike Professor Afonja, I think it's legitimate to doubt the preparedness and the qualification of our current president to be the one representing us. But of course, you know, if, if it is a, um, a summit of head of state, it has to be our head of state. If we think the head of state is not educated enough to represent us in a summit of education, then we probably need to change our criteria for electing head of state or use our discretion to vote for the ones that we think has um, a higher level of education. I am not as optimistic as Professor Afonja on the future of Nigerian education for the simple fact that education is a very social phenomenon. It is not biology, it's not natural. If you don't put the right things in place, it's not going to happen. You cannot attain a world-class education if the people managing it and the system they're managing is analog and slow and confused and underfunded. The, the magic does not happen in, 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 in the social setting. Magic happens in nature. Um, so the, the, that is not something I, I, would, um, I would readily endorse, that, that, that kind of endorsement. I also think that the, the people of Nigeria need to wake up to its real problem. There's no magic why the academic union staff go, keep going on strike. It's not a good thing that they go on strike. But let's call it spade a spade. They go on strike because the government agrees to something and then the government disengages from what they agree. If the government is not able to keep promises, they should not make those promises from the onset. But it would be good to appeal to the union of academics as well, you know, to understand the gravity of keeping young people out of learning. It, it's not a good thing. That's a very grave thing to the situation. And I also think that, where possible, the Nigerian elites, starting from those in public office, need to really look at themselves in shame. Because when I count the number of cabinet ministers and the number of all high officials in Nigeria whose children study abroad rather than in the universities and other institutions where they're charged to take care of. It tells, you, it tells you how bad the situation is. Of course, everybody has the right and duty to provide the best for their well, pros, for their children. On that note. But the public service should, should be given a heavier burden. Well, uh, Professor Kela, thank you very much. At this point, I think uh, Yemi Adamalekun is out there. Yemi Adamalekun, your take on these two subjects. Thank you very much, and good evening again, everyone. Um, I'll pick up a bit from where 
Mr. Killer left off. Look, police and so let's start. Well, actually, let me start with police, then I'll come to education. Police and criminals working hand in hand is a time honored tradition globally, so it's not peculiar to Nigeria. But in most other parts of the world, they're kind of quiet about it. They don't flaunt it. They don't throw it in our faces. And our, our so-called super cop didn't not only flaunted it, but had the temerity to issue a statement saying that a criminal was giving him money to buy, buy clothes. And at what point as an officer that I am paying your salary turns you into a tailor? I mean, and I'm sure some of you have seen the memes on social media with his face on the head of a tailor. And it's, it's laughable, but it's also very deeply disturbing just to show the level of, I don't know if it's hubris or whatever you want to call it, that you're dealing with a guy who is on Instagram flaunting wealth that makes no sense. So even if for the sake of argument, he hadn't been convicted of a crime or he wasn't a criminal at the time, his source of wealth could not be identified. So as someone whose job it is to investigate criminals, um, to maintain some sort of public face of being above the sort of up, I don't know, morally upstanding, whatever the word is, to be unashamedly fraternizing with someone of that nature and then be bold enough to issue a statement that, yes, he corresponded with me and asked me to arrest someone who threatened his life. So if I call you now and say, arrest anybody that's threatening my life, you just get up and do it because that's your job. Meanwhile, the people who are really need people to protect them, you guys are nowhere to be found. So I think for me, that's pretty much a, a very interesting take on even how he sees what he has done. I mean, there's an honor tradition as well that judges don't go to social gatherings so that they are not in places where they'll then have to sit in judgment and a case of people where they have attended their social functions. And I believe our police, in a sense, at a certain level, should be like that as well. And DCP Abakiari, from his Facebook page to his Instagram, clearly violates that on many levels. Um, AI, the retired AIG that spoke was very interesting. I loved his transition in his comments. He started off by saying, we don't know anything because all we've read is in the pages of the paper. And that's actually not true because the Department of Justice documents are in the oh. public domain, unlike ours. But by the end of his interaction with you, he had switched to say, well, given what we have read, I will not be surprised if he's, his white is stained, if I want to use that word. So I thought that was quite interesting. In a sense, admitting that what we have read is true, so to speak. But I think this is very significant for Nigeria on the back of NSAS, because at the, at the heart of it, for NSAS, even though it was the special anti-robbery squad, it was really just about a police force that is unaccountable and a police force that doesn't really care about Nigerian citizens. The body language from Mr. President on down, and also the actions of this administration has shown that they didn't take NSAS very seriously. Panels have met. Um, we tracked 29 panels, 29 states and the FCT set up panels. Some states blatantly refused to set up any panel. But the 29 states and the FCT that set up panels, we've tracked them since October of last year. Only two continue to meet. I think Lagos and Oyo, if I'm not mistaken. Others have stopped meeting. Some, I think Quara and Niger have submitted their reports. But none of these reports are made public. So you've submitted them. We don't know what was in it. We don't know who's been indicted, what punishment you're giving to any police officer. So the opportunity to also signal to Nigerians that we hear you and we're doing something has also been has also been lost. And that was one of the main demands during NSAS as well, that let it be seen by Nigerians that you're taking these things seriously and people who have been indicted. Because at the time of the NSAS protest, there were police officers who had been indicted, but their files were just sitting on the floor somewhere. Nothing had happened to them. They hadn't been sent to jail or, or um sentence if, if that's the word so i thought that was it's but again symptomatic of, of a larger problem of a country that has really very low regard for accountability and if abakiari says he's going to sing like a canary let's just pray that abakiari does not become a victim of extrajudicial happenings as is known to happen in the police force on education it was really a pleasure to listen to professor for speak and i was quite um, glad that by the end of it he still said he was quite hopeful for Nigeria, even though he said he was impatient. And I quite understand it. He's, he's served a lot and he's, um, he would like to see some glimmer of hope in his final years. As Mr. Killer said, and that's where I wanted to start, 
if it's a summit of heads of state, even though President Buhari is not your most articulate, not the most visionary when it comes to Nigeria, nor the education sector, will not be our choice. But because it's a summit of heads of state, he's he would go because he will not delegate anybody else to go. Because, again, let's not forget, he was going to London not only to attend, but also for a medical checkup. So it made sense. And I guess for Nigeria, it's good. We save money that it's only him that went, rather than maybe two different people. But anyway, um, back to Professor Abuja's point is really just spot on. In the, in the larger context of how we value education, it's around the whole value chain, from primary education, secondary to tertiary education. We're a country that doesn't. Because when you, a country sits and signs an agreement with people who are custodians of your tertiary institutions, and then you break it every time, it just shows that you're not serious. So global summit promises, plenty English, plenty grammar, but on the home front, and I'm not really particular about what the US or the UK or whoever is pledging or promising, until we take education seriously and we realize that that's part of our path to development as a country, then it will all continue to be talk. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Yemi Adamalekun. I will come back to you on the next topic. But now, Professor Akintenwa, you have spent <coughs> also your entire life in the entire in the education sector. I like the interventions of uh, both um, Alakpini and um, Professor Afanja. And uh, what I found common to their two submissions is the theory of an uh, index. Um, Professor Afanja talked about a uh, lie index, <laughs> and I like it. Um, former AIG Alakpini talked about situation, top of situation. He said the policemen, those who are still there, Whenever he made efforts to advise them to put them through, they would respond that they were on top of the situation. But from his own perspective, he did say that it is the situation that is on top of them. I'm looking at it that, look, we can bring the submissions of um, uh, Professor Afonja and uh, Alakmini together. Uh, first of all, we should be talking about uh, situation index, that is top situation index, and lie index. And I look at the two as two major dynamics of the problematic in Nigeria, problematic of uh, political governance, because at the epicenter of political governance in Nigeria is lie, dishonesty of purpose, <laughs> political chicanery. And at the end of the day, there's, any, there's no issue you want to deal with that it is not induced by dishonesty, by lie telling. This is why I want to encourage Professor Afonja to provide a new methodology in his analysis. He did um, identify, for instance, the critical issues. According to him, he talked about um, girl education, um, issue of uh, adequate funding, quality of education, gap between educated, the elite, and the non-educated. And um, in this case, in addition to these four critical issues, I think that at the epicenter should have been this uh, lie index. Lie index is at the center of the circle. Now, the other concentric circles following, they are this girl education and so on and so forth. At the epicenter, this lie index explains why there's problem at the parental attitude to girl education. Because the parents have not been truly told about the beauty of education, all right? They are being misled. There's no general enlightenment. Now, inadequate funding for education. You cannot claim on the one hand that education is good, that you need it, and you still refuse to fund it well. 
Now, if you take uh, the gap between the educated and the non-educated, it's still the same story. Now, uh, why is it that we are telling ourselves lies? If the president is going on medical checkup in the past, it is the society that compel the presidency to be telling us what the, uh, our own president would be um, going out for. A president will be going for medical checkup, they will be telling us different stories. It's not good enough. Now, there's nothing we want to do that the government will tell the people the truth. I think this issue of lie index has to be taken more seriously. Now, I do not agree with um, Professor Afonja on some issues, although part of them, yes. He said that um, our uh, the president, um, no, the senator who raised the issue. That As Dino was, Melaye. Mm -hmm. His name is Senator Dino Melaye. Now that um, the president did not have this qualification, did not have that one. Yemi gave uh, a part explanation to it. You see, in international protocol, if a meeting is supposed to be held at the summit level, you cannot delegate. The president has to be there. It's, it's there. If, for instance, we are talking about a um, bilateral relationship, you, are, you have a um, strategic cooperation, you have a partnership, you have various levels. There are levels of meetings requiring the attendance of the president, the numero uno citizen. So this one is presidential summit. So the president has to be there. Uh, the explanation is given is good. But the senator, Senator Melai, is not wrong. What he is saying is not that he is going there um, as an incompetent person. No. The issue is not competence or incompetence. The issue is that only God knows the qualification of uh, the president in this particular case. Because efforts are made to establish, all right, what are the qualifications of the president? That matter has been settled by the Supreme Court. I, Prof, I, with due respect. What the Supreme that matter Court said, was settled. I am not saying the Supreme Court uh, has You don't not need said. a degree to attend the summit of heads of this, Look, hold on. As you well know. If you are explaining uh, Melai's point, we must explain it in the way he put it, context. I'm only explaining what he said. I also listened to the video. What he's trying to say, as distinct from what the Supreme Court said, Supreme Court said Mr. President was eligible to contest. Simple. Good. The issue now, uh, Melaya is not saying that he's not eligible to contest, but he's saying that, look, he does not have X, Y, Z. So there are two different things. You but know, whatever I'm is saying the case, that matter was settled, and um, uh, Dino Melaya, as uh, Senator of the Federal Republic, uh, he could have proposed uh, a bill, a motion, asking for a review of the part of the Constitution dealing with the qualification for the office of the president. So it's totally, in my view, immaterial in this particular context. You may not be far from being wrong. The only... <laughs> no, I may not be far from being right. Well, it's both ways. You see, yes, that, that I, I are... cannot be more correct, Prof. Yeah, you cannot be more correct. You see, that it depends on the issues you are dealing with. You see, in this case, for instance, if a professor killer He's saying that uh, Nigeria's image uh, um, is not the issue. That is the freedom of the policeman, etc. Please look at what is said in um, the editorial of uh, this day today. Look at it. Last year, the U.S. government said this. Foreign, I quote, foreign citizens perpetrate many business email compromise scams. Those individuals are often members of transnational criminal organizations which originated in Nigeria but have spread throughout the world. So when we are talking about Kiari, this is the issue now being raised internationally. The international responsibility of Nigeria as a sovereign state is raised. That of the police is rich. It goes beyond that. The perception of the Nigerian, whether you are born by blood descent or by marriage or whatever, is at stake. 
That is why, for instance, the issue of Kiari should not just be taken on a platter of gold. It has gone beyond that. And when you look at the attitudinal disposition of the government of the United States, they are not taking it the way we, we do it in Nigeria. It's only in Nigeria that, for God's sake, everybody will be found right, not guilty. But when they go abroad, the contrary is the case. Allah me say James Ibori. Uh, here in Nigeria, they are good people, but elsewhere they are not. D ditto for Abba Kiyari. Abba Kiyari uh, in Nigeria is a good call, super call. But in the eyes of the Americans, it's a dubious call. And that is why, in conclusion, you will see that Shakespeare cannot be more correct when he said in Margaret, there is no art of finding the human construction from the face. Yes, uh, on that note, uh, Professor Akintena, we will take another short break. When we return, uh, Dr. Nwaneri, I'll take your views on the two subjects we've taken so far. We'll be right back. Welcome back to This Day Live, the Sunday talk show here on the Arise News channel. I still have with me in the studio, Professor Bola Akintenowa. I also have with me in here, Professor Antony Killer, uh, Yemi Adamoleko, Executive Director in Office Enough, and Dr. Ndidi Nwaneri. Before we went on that break, Dr. Nwaneri, I was going to come to you to comment on the twin issues of uh, the indictment of DSP Abakiari mm. and also the Global Education Summit, Summit, where President of Nigeria made certain commitments. Okay, so I'm going to start with the police. I'm not going to talk about any individuals. I'm going to tell you what I think about the Nigerian police. If somebody can make a call to an institution in Nigeria, and based on that, someone else is locked up for a month, to the point where an officer <laughs> sends pictures of sores on the person's body and gets permission from, okay, so he hasn't been indicted, a character like Hush Poppy grants you permission or, or says it's okay to release somebody. We do not have an institution. Now, I, the word that has, with due respect to everybody that has spoken, the word that has been running through my mind is hypocrisy. Who is going to tell the emperor that he is naked? Do we have a police force? No. If everybody in this room can be picked up based on a phone call, I don't want yes, to speak. play by that title, by Mr. <laughs> Fred Agbeyegbe. Yes. <laughs> the emperor okay. dances naked. <laughs> so, <laughs> please carry on. <laughs> what I will suggest to the Nigerian public is that we've reached a point where we take the Nigerian police, pour it on the floor the way we used to do, inside a bucket, pick out what is good in it, trash the rest, and reorganize the Nigerian police. We cannot continue like this. Look, the, and then why hasn't anybody resigned? And who trained this man? Who, where, where did he graduate from? What kind of system produces somebody mm -hmm. like this? Mm -hmm. Let us not forget that his subordinates watched all of this happen. And all of us are quiet. We're, we think we can repair and fix. And then the inspector general of police says to us that um, he's going to, he has set up a panel and he recommended, I'm like, come on, this man was your subordinate. Who is taking responsibility for what happened? Um, I like what uh, Yemi said earlier, that um, <laughs> he, she tied this back to the NSAS protest. So please, eh, I want to understand everything that came out during those protests. What are we doing about it? Why do we still talk as if we have a police force? We do not have a police force. However, it has been said that, yes, there tends to be collusion and corruption between um, in a lot of societies, they have this ongoing, let me call it ongoing system of cleaning out the police. But I think we have passed that line. Where we are right now, the only way we can move our society forward is by taking the police, as I said, taking it all apart and putting it back together again. Let's stop deceiving ourselves. Who has Abakari trained? Who trained him? Where did he come? It is a system that I'm concerned about, not him as an individual. We have a police training college in Lagos, Ikeja. Ikeja. We have another police training college in Joss. I did not imply that they are not trained. 
I am saying that what is the system that manages not to see this type of tendency? What kind of police force is it that, so he, from what I read, that as I mean, said, is in the public domain, from what I read, he did not personally go and pick Chijoke up. He delegated Chibuzo. It. Chibuzo, sorry. Vincent Chibuzo. I think he's from my tribe. <laughs> 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 so the reason I put that in is that I, 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 I know my people. The minute we start having this conversation, somebody is going to, oh, people call me and tell me that, oh, that Abakir is not from my local government area. That is why I'm saying. So I'm not even talking about him. I'm talking about the system. And the minute we try to fix, I don't know what the Nigerian police will do. I don't know what the Nigerian government will do. But please, they should look for people that are willing and able to reform that institution. If not, Dr. Well, Abati, no, all of us are at risk. No, Dr. Wanere, if I may just add uh, a footnote. Mm. Now, all of these are still at the level of allegations. Mm. DSP Abakiari, uh, he, you know, will have his day in court. Okay. And we expect that he will defend himself. Okay. So we should not engage in trial by media. Okay. We cannot reach any conclusions for now. Except for what he said on his Facebook page. Or was it hacked? Yeah, from Super Cop to Super Taylor. Well, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to move on because the, we are the answer to time. your system is the lie index. The lie index. The lie is there. I'm going to go back to <laughs> Professor B.E. Akonde because B. it's... B.E. Afonja. B.E. Afonja. I wrote it wrong. Yeah. Okay. So um, there's one major point that I disagree with him on. And um, maybe because I'm very, very committed to education and girls, um, the girl-child education. First of all, again, hypocrisy. In Nigeria, we're still struggling with age of the... I do a lot of work in um, social policy. We're still dragging matter of what is, what is the minimum age. Maximum age or is it minimum age? Sorry, my brain is doing funny things. What is the age, legal age, below which you cannot get married legally in Nigeria? The, the Child's Rights Act, we're still dragging the age that of matter. consent is 18. Age of consent is 18. There are some states that refuse that, okay? And they want to lower it to 16. And they do have, again... Explanation is not justification. There's, a, there's an explanation as to why they would prefer that way. We're still dragging that matter. Something happened. So someone like Arab Moy, historically, he was considered by the Western media as a dictator. And I use scare quotes, dictator. One of the things that he did was that he, there was a problem with girl-child education in Kenya. And the way they addressed it was through the boarding school system. The idea being that weekends... Um, holidays, teach the girl any home training you want, but when school is in session, because the complaint was that housework was distracting the girl, so they were not doing as well as the male well, students. Yeah. Now, the result of that is that many years later, you see, in a developing country, any level you educate a girl to, she will make sure, with due respect to the men, no, a woman will not tolerate her child being less educated than she is. Women in developing countries, they don't agree. This research was shown in the 60s in Brazil. So we know that it is not a truism. It is not just nice words to say, if you want to educate a country, educate the women. It is because a woman, will, by fire, by force, her child must do either at least as well as she did. So... I, he, he talked about attitude. He says that the attitude of the parents is what is deterring girl-child education. Well, I grew up in a country that nobody wore seat belts, and everybody thought seat belts was a joke. The government simply legislated it. And, okay, I'm not going to go on and on about the police, but the way it worked those days was, oh, you gave food to the olokbas if you were not wearing your... Seed belt. Now it is tradition. In the same way, I strongly believe that if it is legislated, we will solve the problem. You don't have to wait for attitude change. The government can preempt attitude change. And then I'm also more jaded with regards to education. I feel that there's a deliberate political attitude among the political elites. There's a functionality to not having, um, not educating particularly the masses. And we, ha we need to have that conversation because I think it's deliberate. I think it's malicious. I don't think it's a mistake. And then I want to ask the educationists that if every single child that wanted to go to school in Nigeria showed up at the gate of schools, 
Do we have the space to accommodate? No. So you see, there's this divide, there's this hypocrisy, where the state is claiming that they want to educate everybody, yet they don't have the space. But well, the point I'm I'm going to move on now. If I'm a, if the I'm point a, of Professor Afonja is still correct. If I'm a, if He's not wrong. Yeah, I'm it, also it, in support of Professor B. Afonja's point about mm. the appropriate focus at the Global Education Summit on the gay child education. Mm -hmm. And as to your point, Dr. Wanere, I would recommend to you uh, C.C. Dangereba's uh, novel, Nervous Conditions, mm -hmm. and then uh, Buche Mechita's uh, The Slave Girl mm -hmm. and The Bright Prize. Mm -hmm. These are novels that mm -hmm. have dealt with the subject. But on that note, let's move on very quickly. Very quickly, I'd like to say one last thing, please. One um, very last thing. Um, I don't see any reason why... See, we have to remember that we're a former colony. Two points, actually. The first one is that developing countries give away one trillion every year to service debts. So I don't understand the point of the summit and with regards to education financing. How no. is the money going to be split? We don't know. No, the United Kingdom is uh, you know, committing itself to making more donations uh, to 90 countries around the world and encouraging these developing countries to commit to the education, education for level. all Dakar Dac Declaration mm -hmm. uh, and also the World uh, Education Framework, which says that countries must commit between 15% to 20% of their annual budgets to education. That's the whole point. And that's the commitment expressed by the United Kingdom with the support of these uh, other countries. But let's move on. Let's move on. Yes. Our next subject. The leader of the Islamic movement in Nigeria, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zakzaki, has been released after six years in detention. El Zakzaki and his wife Zinat were discharged and acquitted by a Kaduna State High Court. Justice Gideon Kurada upheld the no-case submission filed by Zakzaki's lawyer Femi Falano, ACM, saying witnesses presented by the prosecution have been unable to establish any connection between the charges and Zakzaki. The court has indeed upheld our no case submission. The court found, and quite rightly, that the charges that were filed in the year 2018, portion to a penal law enacted by the Cardinal State Government in 2017, over offenses that were allegedly committed in the year 2015, is an initial incompetence. Hello, Yemi uh, Adam Alekun. Um, I'd like to come to you on this. This is about justice. This is about human rights. This is about due process. Yemi Adam Alekun, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good. All right. Yeah. I mean, I think the summary by Marshall was actually quite interesting that you passed the law in 2015 and mm -hmm. charged someone for actions in 2015. And as Marshall said, it, it was in competent. I mean, there was, I think, at the time when Malame Rufai was invited to be a speaker at the NBA conference uh, last, was it last year, I believe, there was a big uprising against Kaduna State's record of human rights violations in holding people indefinitely. There's Dadiata that's still missing. It's been missing now, I guess, for over two years, and nobody knows what's happened to the young man. So I think it is indeed something to be celebrated, but I do understand that Kaduna plans to appeal, uh, plans to appeal it. Mala makes, but anyway, I'm happy for Zazaki, his wife. He's a man that has lost three sons in this whole journey of freedom of expression, freedom of association. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, Dr. Waneri, let me come to you quickly. So I don't know if I got this information right, but I understand that um, the Kaduna State Government plans Has on, filed an appeal. Yes, has filed an appeal and um, plans on um, pursuing the matter. But my question is, um, there is some incompetence, right? Because what exactly is it being charged for? So um, when it comes to terrorism and things like um, sovereignty, and things like um, offenses against the state, like if you're going to try somebody for treason, if you're going to try and declare a republic, there are certain things, the government has a bit of leeway, right, to push the envelope. I feel that the government and successive regimes should be very, very clear 
about what they are accusing this man and his wife of. They should be very, very clear. That way, they, they couch it in. We all know that there's a problem here. But the question is, what is the nature of the problem? And how do we address it? So there was some incompetence, right? And I'm hoping that we'll be able to resolve the matter by not violating the man's rights too much. However, if he has done something wrong, the state should be competent enough to define exactly what the problem is and pursue it from there. That's all I'm going to say. Well, Professor Akintanwa, very quickly. President Muhammadu Buhari told us that for him, national security interest overrides rule of law. Rule of law deals with your freedom of expression, etc. Mm. But if the president, if his government, if his administration mm. sees you as a threat mm -hmm. to national security interest, then please, national security interest overrides. Mm -hmm. And that explains why, uh, for instance, uh, Zagzaki and the wife and his movement might have been treated as such. So for as long as you agree that uh, for him, for our president, national security interest overrides, then the explanation, the situation in understanding it cannot be far-fetched. Well, Professor Killer? I think um, a lot has been said. M most of the things have been said. I, I just wonder why we end up putting so much on the um, political system and demanding so little of the rest. Because in reality, never mind what the president says, whether the, um, the, the rule of law should be subjugated to 20 other pieces, the judiciary has the duty and privilege of standing up to the political class. And I think whilst it is true that we have a system problem driven by the political class, I also argue that it is important for us to unbundle that kind of matters and, and see the duty of each part in order to help the whole. I think it's not a good thing that um, people are detained for a very long period. And first of all, they're detained for long with no process, with no charges or with no day in court. Then secondly, to be dragged for a very long time, only to be acquitted of all charges, does not look good on the system itself. Justice should be clear, justice should be swift. And I think we need to remind ourselves of that. Last topic for the day. While other countries were celebrating medals in Tokyo, there was a protest in Team Nigeria's camp on Friday over the disqualification of 10 athletes for not meeting the minimum testing requirements under Rule 15 governing the National Anti-Doping Federation. The announcement was contained in a statement from the Athletics Integrity Unit, an independent body created by World Athletics to manage doping and non-doping integrity, issue, integrity issues. The total number of 20 athletes were declared ineligible, 23 actually, uh, from Belarus, Ethiopia, Kenya, Morocco, and Ukraine. However, Nigeria was the most affected and was included in category A at the start of 2020, following a continued period of weak domestic testing levels. Rather than take full responsibility for their feelings, the sports ministry and also the uh, Nigerian Olympics Committee labeled those affected as alternate and foreign students, athletes, whose tests did not meet with sample collection and analysis, analysis standards. Well, Professor Akinten, earlier on off camera, you were saying that in fact the number has uh, increased to 11 yes. uh, with the, uh, now the disqualification of Blessing of Kagbari, another Nigerian uh, uh, medal of war. But, you know, watchers of the scene of the developments are concerned that, look, Nigeria is putting up a very disgraceful uh, you know, uh, performance at the Tokyo Olympics, owing mainly to the failure of the Ministry of Sports, the Athletics Federation of Nigeria, and also 
the Nigeria Olympics uh, Committee. Some people are arguing, well, maybe you don't blame the ministry, maybe you should blame the Federation and also the Olympics Committee. Why are we like this? Some people ask. In the early 70s, we used to have some public commercial buses. Oshinowo, all these uh, buses there. And uh, they called them Okueko by that time. Uh, on the buses, it is written, do not give bribe. Both the giver and the receiver are guilty. In this case, the authorities, the ministry, the athletic federation, as well as the athletes, I think they are all guilty. In this case, the government, the ministry, what is the extent to which they have been able to fund, to ensure the well-being, the welfare of, um, of the athletes, of the delegation taken to Japan? Now, in this case, uh, the way they were treated, even in Japan, from various reports that we have, it doesn't give any good impression that they are well catered to and catered for. So in this case, um, the, the, the sportsmen, sportswomen sent there also should have known that they are not supposed to take certain drugs. They are there. If you are not told by your supervisor, by your, by your ministry, what prevents you from also complying? This clearly explains this issue of a lie index, hypocrisy that indeed there is. Anything we do in Nigeria, they are generally predicated on hypocrisy, on lies, and it, it, this is not good for our future. Well, I mean, many Nigerians are bothered that uh, all the hopes about winning uh, medals will seem uh, to have been dashed. But we're still relying on uh, Ese Brume and one or two uh, athletes to make a difference. Dr. Wanere, quickly. So there's nothing, there's nothing you put on the fire that uh, we say there's nothing that you're cooking that corruption will not spoil. It is not the athletes that have a problem. I don't think they took any substances. I think it is, or maybe they did, because I wasn't there. I mean, I can't say that categorically. But from what I gather, it's more of a systemic problem. It's a problem of them not being, the people that were responsible to do certain things, right, in the institutions within Nigeria did not rise to the occasion. And the athletes are suffering because of that. First of all, why are we on a high risk list to start with? So it is not, I, one of my favorite sayings is that it is not in the kitchen that you decide whether or not there will be meat in your soup. You make that decision earlier. So as soon as we're put on some list where we're like high risk, in other words, watch out for the athletes coming from this country because they probably would um, fail our tests. That is when we should have sat up. And then who did we delegate to handle this? Where are our incident reports? Very soon, this story is going to stop trending. So what are we going to do? How are we going to make sure this doesn't happen to us again? How can we be destroying our athletes' lives and saying that people are not willing to stick up or represent Nigeria? So I'll just stop. Well, the issue is one. about Rule 15, exactly. under the anti-doping yes. regulations provided by the Athletics Integrity Unit. Mm -hmm. The athletes are required to take three out-of-competition tests. Yes. And as far back as April 2020, uh, a gentleman called uh, Sonde Adele, a technical director of the Guso faction mm -hmm. of the Athletics Federation of Is Nigeria, had raised the alarm. But, uh, you know, because of ego, of because of, uh, <laughs> the, what do you call it, call that, sir? The politics of a uh, human difference. <laughs> or what do you say? No, psychology the of human difference. The psychology of human difference and ego, is politics, that what tribalism is and all of now? that. Well, <laughs> not tribalism. <laughs> So they didn't do what they were required to do. Yeah, they, and these athletes have gone there now, the and it's Nigeria that is embarrassed. Suffering. So it's an issue about the failure of the Athletics Federation of Nigeria yes. and the officials who are there. Yemi Adamalakum, very quickly. We have just about three minutes to go. Thank you very much. I think for me, it's really 
I, I agree with Prof a little bit about the athletes being partially to blame. Um, but I mean, there's the Nigerian context, which just makes things difficult, period. One of the basketballers wrote a piece that's been circulating mm. on WhatsApp about their experience, about how just competing is made so much more difficult mm -hmm. because of the environment that doesn't exist. And it's not the first time. First, we're talking about okay. promises that we made to athletes that are over two decades old. Hmm. We've talked about, I think the last time, maybe it was the World Cup, that the athletes raised the protest that until they get their money, that they are not moving. That had to happen mm -hmm. for some... So, the mm -hmm. stories are bound. But mm -hmm. again, and I think it's Dr. Mane that just made the point, those things happen during the competitions, and then we go quiet mm -hmm. until another competition comes up, and then we start talking. Mm -hmm. But as you've said, these things... So, it's not about doping for me. Yes, they didn't meet it, but... Remember when we were doing tryouts here, there was a young man who was running and the official forgot to turn on the timer. And what could have easily been his, uh, his a, a record for him was not timed, so you couldn't record it. So there's a lot of anyhowness, which is just tied to the lot of anyhowness in governance in Nigeria. So I don't think why we should expect sports to be any different. We've talked about education, we've talked about police. Any given day on this day life, there's any sector we take, it comes back to a governance problem. The Bible says very clearly, without a vision, the people perish. We are the Nigerians perishing. <laughs> Is Yemi so, Adam also among the prophets? <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, let's have uh, Professor Kila to help us wrap this up as we bring the program to a close. But, but I, I think it is clear from what everybody has said that the issue of competence, or better still, that of incompetence, is a glaring, poisonous, and ever-present um, 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 venom in, in, in everything we're doing. I think we should start from demanding for accountability. Perhaps if the press and other good people in this country do not let this matter die, and we continue to ask for who was in charge of it and what is the penalty for bungling something so serious. On the other hand, perhaps those Nigerians that are connected in sports um, who have international connection might <clears throat> lobby the international organization to force Nigeria for standards. The issue of not paying our athletes is a long issue. And I remember once in a convention, I once suggested that they should force Nigerians, the Nigerian government to put the money of the welfare of the athletes in a kind of bond before they come to the competition at all. I think if we sit down to look at the serious issues we have, um, those who can should help this country to come up with cogent solutions to these um, very disheartening um, problems that we have. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kila, Dr. Waneri, uh, Professor Akintarewa, and Yemi Adamalekon. You've been watching This Day Live, the Sunday talk show, here on Arise News. I'm Ruben Abate. From my entire team here in Lagos, it's bye for now, and thank you very much for watching. We'll see you again next week. Thank you.